So yeah, welcome right. all to uh, our Matrix Simri Symposium. Our first speaker today is Greg Koshva, who will uh, speak to us about propagation and structure under the Ritchie flow and uh, applications to shrink from soliton. Thanks, Jonathan, for the introduction. Thanks to uh, you and Matt for uh, the invitation. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to be speaking even at this kind of great distance. Um, right, so uh, I thought today that what I would talk about is kind of a mix of um, some of old and new work, kind of a similar theme. Um, and so generally kind of the, the theme is somehow that that theorems about propagation of, of, of geometric structure on the reach of flow have of applications sort of have applications to uh, the study of uh, geometry of, of, of shrinking solids on. So the basic kind of organizing principle sort of, I think is that um, the reach of flow is a, a geometric flow, right? So it should preserve what special properties a, a, a metric has, special geometric properties a metric has and as a heat equation, in some sense, improve them. Um, but also, on the flip side, of that as a heat equation, it, it should uh, it shouldn't be able to you know, perform miracles in, in a finite amount of time. And so, somehow, um, you know, it, structure which is uh, any, any special structure which you which you see at uh, at some time along a, a a solution, say on some time slice, right? So, if it's special enough, then somehow that should tell you about uh, that structure should somehow be transmitted to the solution uh, at, at a later time and, and vice versa at some point at some point in the flow uh, the, your, your solution has some kind of symmetry or some other kind of you know, rigid geometric property right then and it, the same should be true of the solution at earlier times you know under under reasonable uh, under reasonable assumptions on the on the solution okay so they kind of the work that I kind of want to get to eventually sort of is kind of a special case of this is sort of a Problems of backward propagation of, of uh, uh, warp product structure under the Ricci flow, um, but um, what I uh, the kind of motivating application I think is maybe more interesting in this case, and so I'd like to kind of start by talking about that. It kind of fits into uh, kind of a, a framework of, or a, a class of problems I've been thinking about on and off uh, the last probably decade or so. Um, so roughly speaking, um, roughly speaking, the the uh, this, this application is based on this, this correspondence to kind of hinted to at the beginning, which is that if you, along the reaching flow structure, geometric, the same geometric structure, which you can expect to, to be transmitted along a solution forward and back from time, it corresponds uh, in a sense, in a, in, a, in a certain very precise sense, which we'll see to the uh, features of, of, of the asymptotic geometry of a non-compact shrinker, uh, which, which, you would, which are inherited by sort of the interior of, of the shrinker. And this, um, I think this idea sort of in the formation that I, the way I understand it, sort of this parabolic point of view, um, certainly has its origins in the work of, of Lu Wang. So in her, uh, her paper from about a decade ago on uh, the uniqueness of asymptotically conical uh, self shrinkers the mean curvature flow. So, um, so, right. So let me say, I want to say a little bit about this before we get to the kind of the main problem. Um, so the, the setup here, I think is, these are these definitions are sort of familiar to everyone here. Without um, a, a shrinking a shrinking Ricci soliton uh, for us will mean um, just a met uh, a Ramani manifold together with a, a smooth function which satisfies the sort of the shrinker uh, the shrinker equation. Um, uh, these are these arise as uh, blow ups of finite time singularities in some sense they're, they model uh, on what sort of ought to be at least heuristically should be prototypical. Uh, type one singularities to the flow. Uh, the object is to um, sort of classify these as as completely um, classify these completely as possible. Um, and this is of course already done in dimension in low dimensions, dimensions two and three. So, for example, in in, in two dimensions, really just sort of well, really in two and three dimensions, there's only sort of uh, sort of the expected example, sort of just. Uh, Basically, cylinders. Uh, cylinders are they're, they're in the broadest sense, I guess. Um, so, cylinders, I guess, and and, and possibly uh, some quotient thereof. Okay, and so this is due to the work, sort of this complete in this this kind of final form. This is due to the work of, of uh, many authors, um, and there are many um, uh, in higher dimensions. Of course, you don't expect to have uh, uh, any complete classification, um, but there are there are many partial uh, classifications in um, uh, under under various curvature conditions or 
um, other sort of uh, other assumptions. So the uh, the kind of the the uh, one class of of shrinking solitons for which there's some seems to be some promise at least or it's, or at least it is some some um, some amount of of, of uh, uh, an optimistic amount maybe of rigidity is uh, that the, the class of uh, complete compact uh, complete non-compact shrinking solitons. Um, and so I just uh, remind you that so all at the moment all examples that are known they're either for they fall into one or two one or two types right so they're either uh, smoothly asymptotic to a cone uh, in infinity um, or else they, they split uh, locally at least locally as a product of uh, lower dimensional uh, uh, shrinkers okay and the um, there's uh, some work of Matian and Wong over the last maybe five or six years ago uh, suggests there's some possibility of, of a uh, some possibility of a, of a dichotomy in, in dimension four, right? So their work shows roughly that, at least sort of an asymptotic sense, that if um, the scalar curvature is, is strictly bounded below, um, then well, um, then the then the, the a, a, a complete shrinker is, is asymptotic either to uh, a product or, or is asymptotic to a, a quotient of one of the the two standard cylinders. Uh, along the uh, along each uh, along each end, which they sort of asymptotically, and so they have some some results in this direction. Um, and also, furthermore, they show that if the if the scalar curvature uh, tends to zero as x goes to infinity, right, then uh, then each end of um, uh, each end of the shrinker is asymptotic smoothly asymptotic uh, to a cone. <clears throat> okay, and so of course, it's, this is far from being a, an actual dichotomy. So it's, um, we know in, in some sense that what's known is that the scalar curvature is, is on a non-trivial shrinker is strictly positive, but uh, it's, it's not known, for example, if, if these are the only two alternatives. For example, if, there's an, if you could have an asymptotically uh, conical end uh, together with uh, another end that's sort of asymptotically cylindrical. Um, uh, but there's there's um, there's uh, quite a bit of other evidence, though, at least that, that there's that there might be some sort of structural rigidity to the class of, of complete non-compact uh, shrinking solitons. And so some of, some of that's been done by uh, people at this conference. Uh, mentioned just a few names. So some work of Cow and Joe uh, from uh, 2009, right? Sort of you know give fairly precise uh, asymptotics on the on the on the the growth of the potential function and on the volume. Um, uh, Maury's work of, of, for example, of Yves Lee and, uh, and Bing Wong, and then kind of a, of a, of a rigidity kind of, uh, in a sense, dual to that work, that work which we're exploring today. So today we're more or less looking at asymptotic rigidity, but kind of in a, in a, in a dual sense, uh, very recent work of Colding and Minikotsi uh, on the rigidity of, um, of, uh, of cylinders. Um, but um, so as for this picture, to get back to sort of the, the main thread of this, this talk, so the, the picture, the, the question we're looking at, or the question I'm interested in today is sort of uh, the, the case of asymptotically conical shrinkers. And, um, and I want to point out that there's, there are still very few examples of these known. So there's sort of a, a kind of, a, um, there's the uh, sort of the original, the first construction of a non, of a non-trivial asymptotically conical shrinkers due to Bellman, Oman, and Knopf. So um, just remind you, this is, um, this is uh, so in each in, in even dimensions uh, in each even dimension, uh, starting in uh, dimension four, um, they construct a, some examples. So their example is um, uh, it's a Kähler, um, it's Kähler with a complex rotational uh, symmetry. It's on, uh, sorry, on the tautological end bundle. Um, bundle over um, over uh, CPN minus one, and then these examples were were shortly thereafter shortly thereafter uh, uh, generalized to um, uh, and, and kind of some independent work to uh, 
uh, I, Don Sir and, and Mackenzie Wong and uh, Bo Young. Um, these are also uh, these are also Kaler. Um, these are also Kaler uh, Kaler salt on these, these are on line bundles of over um, products of of Kaler Einstein uh, of uh, Kaler Einstein um, <clears throat> manifolds, and then very recently. Uh, there's there's a, a new set of examples that are due to Angan and Knopf. Uh, these are uh, these are actually are, are um, doubly warped products um, of of uh, over round spheres, and so these are kind of dimension restricted. So I, I believe it's I know they're they start in dimension uh, bigger than five, and I believe the I think the highest dimension they construct in dimension nine. Uh, but in particular, they construct the first um, the first examples of of uh, Kaler, uh, sorry, of non Kaler, uh, non trivial uh, uh, asymptotically uh, conical solitons. Um, and uh, also, very recently, there's a, a nice uh, kind of nice uniqueness result. So, uh, the work of Con of uh, Ronan Conlon, uh, Alex Darrow, and, and Song Sun from a couple of years ago shows, at very least, that so among other things. Uh, the work shows in particular that uh, the the, uh, the FIK soliton is uh, the unique um, 4D uh, Kaler shrinker. Well, that's for my, my handwriting. So you can see why I opted to leave some of the text in, <laughs> in the notes. So uh, 40, so 40 Kaler, uh, asymptotically conical Kaler shrink. So, okay, so kind of the, the, the basic question here, the first, first of our questions are, you know, what are, uh, on a motivating question, anyway, what are the complete uh, asymptotically conical shrinkers? Um, in particular, you know, can we, is, is it possible, you know, is it possible to classify uh, the, the complete four dimensional asymptotically conical uh, shrinkers? Okay, and so to do this, we're going to look a little bit. Uh, let me introduce a little more rotation. Uh, I'm going to kind of I'm going to introduce this, uh, describe in some greater detail this correspondence I was mentioning in the, at the beginning of the talk. But let me just uh, establish notation. So in this, this talk, I'll kind of use um, so sigma. Sigma is going to denote a, a closed uh, closed n minus one dimensional manifold, and then I'll denote the, the cylinder. Um, the cylinder over over sigma by uh, by uh, c sigma, and we'll we'll uh, consider the, the conical metric uh, over over c sigma. And then uh, for short, I'll just write um, c sigma will just be a, G hat. So C sigma will denote the cone over over sigma. Okay. So and the starting place for for uh, what, what comes next, or at least in this in this uh, in this talk, is uh, some work uh, uh, I did jointly with uh, Lu Wang some almost again almost a decade ago. Um, <clears throat> this is um, the theorem. The theorem says that if you have two uh, two shrinkers which are uh, Asymptotic to uh, uh, the same cone along some ends of of the solitons, then uh, the two the two um, uh, the two shrinkers have to be uh, the two metrics are actually isometric near infinity on or at least on a neighborhood of infinity on on these ends. Okay, of course this is a um, so this is a a, a theorem a, a reachable analog of a theorem uh, proven for by Lu Wang um, for for self shrinkers with so mean curvature flow. Okay. And so, in particular, um, this um, this uh, it says so. If even though we have this kind of local statement, the, the statement is 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 local to the end of the the ends of the, the shrinkers. Uh, the, the shrinkers themselves don't have to be or the, the underlying manifolds don't have to be complete or, or have any restriction on the or restriction on the number of ends. Um, if they happen to be complete, then at the very least you can say they're universe, uh, the universal covers are have to be isometric. So it's just a standard analytic continuation. And says um, sort of it says effectively, um, 
uh, that an asymptotically conical shrinker um, is, uh, I'm going to put in the kind of a weasel word here. It's going to say essentially, uh, essentially determined um, by its asymptotic cone. I'm going to come back to this point later, but more or less, this says more or less this says that uh, you know basically the the uh, a shrinker is uh, an SLK clinical shrinker is determined by its cone, and so then the questions you can then ask you can rephrase this original question is you know which which cones can occur as the asymptotic cone of a of a asymptotic clinical shrinker. And and as a first step in this direction, you can then you ask you can ask, you know, if uh, if a cone is um, if a cone is to, to place any any sort of restriction on on the on the shrinkers to which that are or I guess the uh, to the shrinker um, uh, which is asymptotic to it, um, the question is which properties are. Um, Uh, which properties are are shared uh, shared by cone and shrinker? And in particular, we're interested in those in those properties of the of the shrinker, which you can read off by by looking at the cone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So we're building up to this building up to this correspondence. Um, I, uh, for this, I just want to remind you a couple details of the the, the proof. So the the idea, I think the the idea in the in this argument is um, is is to convert the problem uh, to a parabolic problem. Okay, so in some sense, after you know it, the the problem is is purely local to the end. So uh, at first, um, first you know we can basically dispense with the rest of the manifold and just work on the actual on the actual cylinder over over sigma. On this end, provided provided you've, you've gone far out, enough out along the end, <clears throat> you have you can construct uh, uh, the the gradient. I mean the the uh, the integral curves of uh, uh, the integral curves of, of the, uh, the potential uh, vector field will be contained inside that end. So you can construct um, uh, 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 an associated the associated self uh, similar solution on all of this uh, on this end. Uh, it, it will be well defined for for um, time. Uh, on, an, on an interval of from minus one to, to zero, which is in the standard way. Okay, so here our, we're starting our kind of our initial time in this case is, is, uh, my, is time minus one. Um, but so the key, the key fact is that then under these circumstances, under, under assumptions, uh, you see that the solution actually, uh, the solution actually converges uh, to the cone as T, uh, uh, smoothly locally as as t goes to as t goes up to zero. So in fact, the solution is not merely a, a self similar solution on this of half open interval, but in fact a, a smooth solution uh, on on minus one to zero, and which happens to interpolate uh, between the cone and the shrinker. And some sense real it's a solution which realizes both the cone, uh, both the, the the end of the cone and the end of the shrinker as as a uh, as a time slice of, of a common flow. Okay, so that's the key. This is sort of the key um, idea. Um, <clears throat> and this, um, so it, it, important to us because what what this means is it transforms this question. This question we asked here, um, you know, which properties, which properties of the cone can, or which properties of the shrinker can you can you get by? Can you read off simply from the cone? Well, they they, sh they should correspond then to. The question: the questions of which properties, which properties propagate backward in time under under the Ricci flow. So, in this sense, um, so in this sense, this, these these kinds of problems of, of sort of transmission of structure become become uh, fairly clean problems of, of backward uniqueness of, of appropriate systems. Uh, just as a remark, so I won't this too much because. Uh, today, but the, this, I should point out that it's not. Um, I say it's a kind of a clean problem of, of backward uniqueness, but it's some. It's somehow kind of a, an analytically subtle problem. I would say, in the sense that you're, you know, you're making you have a solution which is defined in this incomplete domain, and and un, unlike sort of classical backward uniqueness type theorems, you have no. You're making no assumption on the interior spatial boundary. Um, 
so the, the kind of the work, um, uh, the, the, uh, there is like, there is a, um, uh, the, the, the Carl medicines we use are based on some constructed uh, for linear parabolic inequalities uh, due to uh, some work of Escariatsis, Sergen, Sparak, um, and they, so they, they approve, they consider a similar problem for linear parabolic inequalities uh, on the exterior of, on, on the exterior of a, of a closed ball in, in Euclidean space. So under sort of mild assumptions where they show that uh, a solution, a solution to parabolic inequality, which, which vanishes at some, at some outside symbol in some terminal time, uh, must be must be zero at, at all times, and that's in, crucially without any assumption on the on the interior boundary. Okay, okay. So so much for the uh, so much for the prologue. So this kind of leads to this leads us to kind of a dictionary of of, of sorts between uh, uh, between these these properties, you know, these properties which are preserved by the Ricci flow, and these properties which are um, uh, properties of the of the cone which which transfer to the the, the shrinker. Um, so for starters, right, you can say, so for a shorthand, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let CBC denote just a solution of com a complete solution of bounded curvature, sort of a classical, uh, a classical setting for the, the Ricci flow. Okay, so on one side, we'll have a, a, a CBC solution to the Ricci flow, on the other side, we'll consider the setting of a, of a shrinker, which is smoothly asymptotic to a cone along an end. <clears throat> so in, in the first case, right, so one, one basic fact about the Ricci flow is that, for, at least for these classical solutions, right, and the isometry group, um, the isometry group is uh, preserved. So this, this is, you know, uh, this involves work of, this is just falls from the usual uniqueness and, and background uniqueness there. So Hamilton, Chen and Zoom. Going back to, Um, going back to well, early the early days of, of, of the Ricci flow, and, and then sort of for the back region, you some based on some work from uh, uh, 2009, and um, also a while back. Um, so corresponding to this, right? So that if we have so so if 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 symmetry somehow propagates forward and backward along the Ricci flow, then there should be a corresponding statement for uh, for. Uh, for shrinkers, in one case, there's sort of an obvious. There's an obvious case if you have if the shrinker has some kind of symmetry. Well, of course, just sort of just by continuity, right? You expect the cone should to receive this. Uh, um, sort of, I think the more interesting is the opposite direction. So, so we can say in this case, for example, that um, the cleanest way to say this is that the isometry group of the of the link um, has to embed in the or will embed in the end. Or will embed in, in the uh, on some neighborhood of infinity of the end. Okay, and so this is this is um, in part from work for Lou Long and I from 2013, and sort of this particular statement. We did a bit of a refinement of that. Um, this is uh, which we did in, in 2000, uh, 2018, and uh, under some under some additional conditions. So. Um, under some additional conditions, you can actually argue that the the isometry group of the of the the link will embed inside the entire um, the uh, will inside the isometry group of the entire shrinker. So this this gets back to this 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 point I, I raised before. I kind of I said that somehow this the um, that the we only kind of know that the end of a shrinker uh, essentially, or sorry, the uh, an asymptotic conical shrinker is only somehow essentially determined by the by the end of or by its, its asymptotic cone, and this it gets to the sense is that we don't it's, it's not the case we don't know at the moment. Is I I don't know an argument a full argument of the fact that if you have two shrinkers which are asymptotic to the same cone at some end, that they're globally asymmetric. And so um, one case one situation in which you you do know this is uh, when when the shrinkers are Kähler. In this case, what it in this case what you you have a this result of uh, Montiano and and Wong, which says a Kähler shrinker is a complete Kähler shrinker is connected at infinity. And this is something you can apply to the universal cover and, and somehow you're, you can extend, you can, this, this permits you somehow to extend the isometry, this, low, this isometry between the ends to the, uh, to the rest of the shrinker. But this is something, uh, as far as I know, we don't, uh, we don't have it in general. And something that would follow, for example, if you could prove that, that an asymptotically conical soliton uh, has, uh, has at most one end. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so in one part of this, actually, just as a side, maybe it's not really worthy to give uh, to, to know, but I'll just, maybe I'll just point out here that 
so key a key detail in this latter fact is that um, uh, uh, is is the real analyticity of of the kind of the common real analyticity of of well, the real analyticity of the 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 link of the cone, and the fact that the the, the um, both the cone and the and the, the shrinker are both somehow real analytic with respect to the same atlases, right? And so this this you can also see this through this correspondence, right? So we know um, in this case that MGT a CBS solution, in fact, any smooth solution is real analytic in space. Right, and the corresponding statement for uh, one one uh, corresponding statement for cones is that well, in particular the the um, the link of the cone uh, must be real analytic. Right? So particularly, you, get, you can see that some there are there are some um, some manifolds which cannot occur as the link of the of a of, of a cone of a uh, asymptotically conical shrinker. Okay, and then quickly also you can ask what other what other sort of structures generally preserved along the flow. Well, one of these uh, another another one is the the holonomy of um, of a solution. Okay, and so this this is um, so sort of a I think in forward direction is quite as a classical fam due to Hamilton, maybe others sort of aware from from nineteen six, and then some work you know in the backward direction sort of it's a sort of a separate problem, but uh, um, approved in, in 2011, then also uh, refined a bit with a, my student, Mary Cook, um, a couple years ago. Um, so from the statement that the holonomy of, of a solution is preserved, right, that you can, or, or from the, the kind of a, a corresponding application to, uh, to shrink the salt on, is that, for example, if, if the cone if the if the cone is Kähler, right, and then then the um, and the manifold is or then the shrinker itself must be Kähler. In fact, um, so I'm saying here globally Kähler if if the, if the solution is complete. So somehow these 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 sort of so basically for any any of these properties these sort of common properties which are preserved, there's sort of a we have some corresponding statements. Uh, be, for uh, for uh, about the relationship between an absolutely conical shrinker and its cone. Okay, um, so the kind of the starting point for this this work or the, the work I'd like to discuss is you know what what more can you say right? So in some sense, I think I've exhausted at least my knowledge. This these are sort of the these are really the the main properties of of a solution which geometric properties of a solution which are 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 preserved for are preserved in general along the Ricci flow. And so the question is, can we, you know, can this method be squeezed to give us any more information, uh, any more information about asymptotical shrinkers? And so for starters, you might ask yourself the question, suppose, suppose sigma is a product, is a metric product. What are the implications that have about, um, about the shrinker? And in this case, a couple of things you should note. I mean, so generally speaking, this, this sort of the propagation of product structures along the flow. This is, a, this is sort of a special case of the propagation of the preservation of, of holonomy. Uh, in general, um, in general, um, there's no relationship between, or there's, there's there's not much you can say about the holonomy of a of uh, of the link of a cone from um, the, the holonomy of of the cone itself, right? So what you can notice is that, and this is really I mean, it's not really just particular to products, but but you can notice that the cone, um, in particular, uh, is a warp product. Okay, and in this, and according to our correspondence, right, that's saying that in some sense that the the zero time slice, which okay, in our case is actually the terminal time slice of our of our Ricci flow, is is a warped product. Right? So, so you can ask. So this this is a question. Okay, so in what case, you know. Under what conditions um, are are warp product structures? Let's say transmitted, <laughs> transmitted backward in time. One remarks probably most of you are, are familiar with: if a solution right is 
if a solution is a warped product with respect to a solution to reach your flow is a, is, is a warped product with respect to some you know a, a fixed a fixed product structure a fixed metric on the fibers right then um, then in fact the, the fibers have to be Einstein. So this already, you know, we, in, in, it's not the case, um, of course, it's not the case that warp products, uh, uh, <clears throat> that warp products are, are preserved in general forward in time under the flow. And so we, it's, our, it's only, only under very special conditions are these, are these transmitted. Um, and so, you, of course, we could already see that just by looking, looking in, among the examples, right? So we, there are examples in just in the, the family of, of Angen and Knopf, right? You have, you have solutions of doubly warped, things which are doubly warped products, which are, um, uh, of course, which are asymptotic to cones, which are sort of singly warped products at, at time zero. So we know somehow there has to be, uh, we can't expect too general of a, of a result. Generally speaking, for forward time, for time, okay, I should say, you know, for reasonable solutions, this condition is also sufficient. So, so for 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 the for the forwards reaching flow, if you have a provided the, the initial time slice is a warp product with with Einstein uh, uh, Einstein fibers, um, uh, the the flow will continue to uh, remain a warp product, right? And so that that kind of tells you in some sense what what we should expect in backward time. So that's that's going to be kind of this model theorem. So I'm gonna, let me let me just um, go ahead and kind of just introduce a little bit of notation. So start with start with this. So kind of we'll use the no, um, sort of notation generally for a so notation in in BESA. So in this case, our in our in our setup, we'll have we'll consider kind of a global product of 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 two manifolds. So base manifold and a fiber manifold. Um, denote this uh, the center, the projection by pi. Okay. So a warp product a warp product in this uh, in this in this context is a um, just a metric of of uh, this form where here this function h um, this function h is a is a smooth positive function on on b so <clears throat> so um, our our model results sort of by analogy with uh, uh, with the four direction is uh, following so um, suppose you have a, a, a a complete solution of bounded curvature of reaching flow on, on some interval. Um, suppose that the and assume that the fiber is Einstein and okay if if in the case of B is non-compact, um, uh, we need an additional condition on this warping function. So this amounts to uh, basically that the, the 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 gradient of the log of this function is bounded. So this amounts to basically requiring that the, the mean curvature of the of the of the uh, of the of fiber slices right is uh, is bounded. And then in this setting, um, if if your solution has the, the, the structure of a warp product at, at the terminal time, right? Then in fact there are um, uh, there are uh, then it has that that structure for uh, all previous time. So there there are smooth families of metrics on the base, and uh, a smooth family of metrics on the base, and a smooth family of, of positive functions on the base, right? Such that we have the following representation. So. Okay, so this sort of our prototype there, right? So one one um, one correlate I should point out here that kind of falls immediately is is that um, uh, in, in fact multiply warp products of multiply warp products with Einstein factors propagate backward also backward along the Ricci flow. So something you can get just sort of by applying the isolating each of the, the fibers in, the, in a multiply warp product and and applying the theorem to the uh, um, the, the uh, Using what's left as as the base, sort of iterating this. Um, Sorry, okay. So as yes, is this a is this a theorem then? The model. Yes. Is, yes. Okay. Yeah, I've been sort of a prototype. So yeah, so th this is a theorem in its, in its in its own right. But sort of, I'll talk about the proof of this in a in a second. Yeah. So correlated this right, multiple warp products are preserved, right? And so the corresponding statement then for for shrinkers is the following. So if if we have a shrinker which is you know, shrink, which is asymptotic to a cone over, which is a, a cone over a product of, of Einstein manifold, so finite many Einstein manifold. Then the metric is is a multiple warp product on these on these factors on a neighborhood of infinity. Okay. Okay. And so I say this the reason I call this kind of a model theorem in the sense is that so the um, the framework uh, what I'm, I'm really interested in setting up with it is not so much this particular result, which you know, uh, uh, 
by itself, but somehow just the, the, the with the framework, uh, which we need to prove the theorem, which is the kind of, which captures in some sense or measures the, the failure of a metric to be, to be a warped product, right? Then we can, we can, that, that same system as we'll see, can, can then be, uh, um, kind of uh, can be uh, used in other um, in in, uh, in these other settings, in particular in this setting, uh, can be can be uh, uh, applied in conjunction with the backward eating system on on it's got a shrinking salt on background. <clears throat> okay, right. And so in some in some cases, so we haven't really tried to optimize this 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 statement of this model theorem too much. So for example, it's it's the proof the proof gives it's really only necessary that the manifold be a be sort of locally a product of of Einstein manifolds to sort of admit a local, a local, uh, local war product structure uh, with uh, Einstein fibers. Okay, so I just want to point out that the the kind of the, the issue in this, so this what I mentioned in the framework is that well, there's the sort of a natural framework to study the forward propagation of, of these kinds of structures. So, so for so this this equation, if you if you uh, using this equation, sort of a non sots right? You you get you get a system. Um, you can you get a system for the the, the metrics on the base and, and uh, the warping function. So I'm going to just write down something which is equivalent. So equivalent to solving um, equivalent up to diffeomorphisms to solving following system or uh, family metrics G tilde. And the function to U tilde. So metric G tilde and a function U tilde on on the base um, on the base B. So so from this ansatz and, and then adapting pulling back by further diffeomorphism, you 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 arrive at this uh, at this weakly parabolic system, uh, which then you can solve. Uh, excuse me, which you can solve for for this this family of metrics and and family of functions, and then produce a solution to the Ricci flow. Which is a warp product, and then by uniqueness conclude that the the solution is uh, must that our original solution is a warp product. Okay, um, so the kind of the key point the key point here is that in this in this case this ansatz doesn't really help us, right? So uh, in this case, the we we're faced with solving a terminal value problem associated to this this system, right? And so uh, this problem is opposed. So we need to somehow capture uh, we need to somehow capture the uh, yeah, we need to somehow capture the, um, or, you know, somehow measure the deviation from our solution being a warp product in, in some other way. I, I mentioned actually one and one one final note here is that so also another conceivable strategy to approach this kind of this model theorem is to try to apply an, uh, analyticity. And so in this case, we we're in a situation for our, at least for our model theorem where presumably we, uh, you know, we have we're in a situation where we could potentially apply this where we have. Or classical solutions to the Ricci flow, right? They, you have interior space-time analyticity, uh, but in this case, in our particular application to to, to solitons, right? We can't. This, this approach is no good, right? Because we're we actually we want to see propagation from the terminal time, right? We don't expect you know this smooth solution, even for those, even for these these smooth these asymptotically conical solutions to Ricci flow, which flow into the cone and then say leave it out as an expander, right? We don't expect. In our best, you know, sort of our wildest dreams, that the solution is actually analytic through that that interface. Right? And so, in fact, that you know, the examples of canal factors show we get you have possible non-unique smooth evolutions by uh, by expanders from the same cone. <clears throat> so we, we we also want our solution to kind of avoid analyticity in, in this case. Uh, but we, we potentially have this at, at our disposal at our disposal for the, the model fam. <clears throat> okay, so fortunately, there is a there is a way to kind of characterize uh, probably well known to many of you. There's a way to characterize four products in terms of sort of uh, uh, invariance uh, related to this uh, submersion structure. So we're going to use some analog of that. And <clears throat> roughly, if you haven't, I mean, if you haven't seen this before, so on, in the setting where you have a just generally you have a Riemannian submersion, right? You have uh, these two. There's this natural uh, pair of, of complementary um, distributions: uh, the vertical distribution, which is the kernel of the of the differential of the, of the projection, and then the its or its uh, orthogonal complement, the horizontal distribution. And so um, I'm going to kind of so 
using kind of fancy V and fancy H to denote these, distrib uh, these distributions. I'll use just regular H and regular V to denote the projections onto those, um, onto those um, subspaces. <clears throat> and so we can construct these, these tensors. So this, these tensors, uh, uh, A and T. So A somehow measures the, the integrability of the horizontal distribution. T roughly corresponds to the, or roughly corresponds to the, the, the second fundamental form of the, of the, the fiber slices. And then um, this N will denote the, the, the mean curvature uh, vector. <clears throat> and then there's sort of this, uh, from this we can sort of kind of a trace free uh, version of T, which we'll call T naught. Uh, it's noted by that. Let me just, this expression here. So we'll just kind of pull off, uh, it's kind of its vertical, uh, its vertical traces. This is more or less what's in uh, Bessa. So basically, if you have a submersion, right, then the, the, the vanishing of A and T naught and the normal component of the covariant derivative of N is, uh, is equivalent, essentially equivalent to the, the submersion being lo locally having the structure of a warp product. Okay, so this gives us, these guys give, these give some tensorial invariants to try to measure deviation from uh, being a warp product. Um, it turns out, it turns out in our case that it's actually not really convenient to work. All right, it's kind of it's uh, the problem's kind of a mess in general, but it's not very convenient to actually work with the fixed submersion or to work with these fixed uh, uh, these fixed uh, um, this kind of fixed uh, vertical distribution. And so, what we actually what we do is actually we're going to work with kind of analogs, kind of algebraic analogs of these of these things. So in, instead, we take our what we do is we'll take our initial we take our initial distributions, uh, initial uh, initial or initial I should say terminal distributions, but we take our the, the distributions of time omega, and we extend them backwards. Basically, just propagate them backwards uh, by an o, by an ODE in such that they remain uh, orthogonal. So more of this is amounts just kind of using Ulibek's trick and pulling everything back to some some fixed bundle. Um, uh, but this amounts to just solving an ODE in each of the, the fibers with these projections. Okay. And then we can actually define, so this gives us a family of, of, uh, of, of endomorphisms, uh, H, uh, H and V. And we can define uh, at least formally A, T naught and, and something I'll call G, which is the normal component of the, of the covariant derivative of, of N, um, of the mean curvature. Um, we can define them just by the formulas above. They're still, these will be well-defined tensors on the, on the, the manifold. Um, they just, it turns out they just won't have all the usual symmetries associated with, with anti. So we won't, we'll, we're by allowing our, by keeping, allowing our, our, our distributions to, uh, um, to evolve, then we're, we're losing, say, the integrability of, of V. And also, um, it's no longer the case that A sort of somehow directly measures the, the integrability. Uh, okay. <clears throat> but, um, and then associated to this, so, um, so the, if you, if you just sort of, if you compute the evolution equations for, for A, T naught and, and G, right? Well, you, you see they involve, of course they involve the curvature being, the thing that's being a solution to Ricci flow, right? And so kind of the game in this is to, to prolong our system by, by throwing in some curvature quantities, which, uh, which will give us a closed system of inequalities in the end, okay? And so here, so basically you, these are kind of, a little messy, you don't have to study too much, but in some sense we're just kind of decomposing or decomposing uh, the, uh, the, the, the Ricci tensor, the covariant derivative of Ricci and some, uh, uh, one, some particular components of the, of the um, covariant derivative of the full curvature tensor uh, into components or orthogonal to the traces of uh, trace-free components, uh, or components that are trace-free relative to this, this vertical space. Okay, so this, these things all vanish on, uh, on warp products, right? And moreover, if I take these three curvature, uh, so here this, you don't need to worry about this, this notation too much as somehow these upper and lower bars represent horizontal and vertical components, but um, just something as you can think of you as just being something, uh, you know, first order in the, in the, the uh, curvature tensor. So if you combine these, these things into, you group these things together into pieces, so kind of a higher order piece, which you call X, and a lower order piece, which you call Y. So Ys can consist of A, T naught, and G, and also the covariant derivatives of A and T naught. Then, um, then you get, after quite a bit of computation, right, you get a, you get a closed system of inequalities, right? So, um, <clears throat> and, and now this, this result from, uh, now we, uh, we can apply a, 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 uh, this general backward uniqueness result from, 
um, proved uh, for for uh, proved along the way to prove that backward needs the solutions to reach you flow. Um, uh, this is Carlman inequalities, or you can in fact use just kind of energy quotient methods to, to prove this. But you see that x and x and y have to vanish. Okay, and then um, from this, um, in, from this, then in particular, the fact that this m vanishes tells you that the that uh, the Ricci tensor is diagonal. Right, it's particular it, it uh, commutes with the horizontal and vertical projections, and so you you see from this that the these vertical projections. Uh, these vertical projections, uh, sorry, the vertical distribution, horizontal distribution, so these kind of substitutes actually, the vertical distribution actually remains fixed. This is this is why we were kind of cavalier about letting it involved because we knew we could come back and see that it's fixed. And then from this in each way, you you now we can go back to kind of use these kind of classical limits. But now we're working with a, a, an actual uh, Ramanian submersion, and um, and we see that we have this local work product structure. Um, I should also point out that one advantage of this kind of method too is that it gives you an alternate proof of the, the propagation of of, of war product structures, multiple war product structures forward in time. Uh, it works just as well. You can with this system of inequalities, you can apply uh, energy methods and, uh, and see that they vanish. Um, okay, then let me just finish here. So for the the case of shrinkers, right? So as I said, what this this thing before is calling kind of a model theorem. Again, what I was most interested in is the framework. Um, so taking the same system and now applying it on a Ricci flow background um, and actually being a bit less, a bit more careful about the coefficient. So, um, well, we can see that it meets um, these, the same system on this Ricci flow background will actually meet the, uh, will satisfy the, the hypotheses of a background uniqueness theorem that sort of, this is just a slight variant of, of something that was uh, the one I proved in our uh, original paper. And so uh, this, this system, um, uh, you know, tracking these coefficients a bit better. In this case, you know, we need in this case we actually have decay of the mean curvature, this sort of stuff. Um, uh, we see that this uh, that well, we get the same result on on a on a shrinking salt on background. Yeah, so that's so that's kind of that's that's kind of how it works. I guess I'm kind of out of time here. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Brett. Are there any uh, are there any questions for Brett? Brett, do you if suppose. Uh, you have a Ricci flow that flows to a cone at time zero, and it's the cone of a shrinker. Do you know that it the Ricci flow is the shrinking shrinker? It's easy for me to think in the mean curvature flow world, but yeah, I believe that yeah. If you have a if you have a solution, so under so okay, let's say under some reasonable, let's say it's sort of prior to flowing to the cone, it's sort of reasonable, right? So somehow it's sort of kind of asymptotic. You know, it's. It kind of roughly looks like a coin and then flows in. Then it must. Then it. Then it is just a backward. It is a. Uh, it is kind of a just a backward uniqueness thing. Just, you can use this result with Lou and I. So, if just the the rescalings in this case. You you can pull the rescalings. Uh, these kind of homothetical diffeomorphisms or right, or dilation maps. These give you a. Um, this gives you. They work as you know applying the dilation map and then say dividing by whatever the scaling factor squared or whatever. This gives you uh, 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 this fixes the the time zero metric right. So uh, the time the the cone metric right. And then so that family now you look at the family of so you then you have a one parameter of solutions to reach a flow all which have the same final time. And so then you see that they're all equal by the uniqueness theorem, or you know as under these assuming these assumptions the uniqueness and then you get then then you can differentiate with respect to that parameter and then um so that's yeah that's a good question so so that's one thing that you know what so in fact you know being a cone at time at some time if you have a you know it's, it's a very special property what is it what does it give you well this is one of the things that does tell you right that it's all that it you must be self-similar in some sense under under reasonable conditions at previous so, so even if you don't know that a priori there's a shrinker that has that cone if you that's right that cone, then you had to have been a shrinker that's right that's right i see yeah. oh cool thanks I've got a pretty vague question, Brett. Just wondering whether there are sort of sensible boundary conditions, situations where these kind of backwards uniqueness results might hold. I know uh, you know it's a bit of, hard to do boundaries. What do you mean by boundary conditions? And uh, spatial boundary. Whether whether you have a setting where where you have something with spatial boundary condition, then you can still do backwards uniqueness. Well, yeah. Well, in general, I guess if you have, I mean, I think if you control the inner boundary, you know, so if you're a subject, you know, some some sense, I think if you, um, uh, I mean, I, well, sort of in the linear case, I guess it kind of reduces to being kind of homogeneous, right, at the the boundary, right. Um, I, I don't know what you mean. Somehow, uh, 
So in this case, there's no, in this case, we made no, I mean, you're saying if we took, if we, you, you assume then this, that you, yeah, maybe I don't understand what you're asking. Yeah, well, very vague question, but I'm thinking of, of something like um, Ritchie flow with a boundary condition, or instead of having non-compact and asymptotic to a cone or something like that, just having. The setting would be, but they have the same boundary, but the two suits have the same boundary condition. Yeah. Right? Presumably, yeah, for, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, so I haven't thought, yeah, so for, I don't want to be too glib, I would think, you know, the standard, there are sort of the kind of classical theorems for for linear parabolic inequalities with with uh, you know with, when you have you know sort of identical you know the same boundary conditions. I mean, you know, I think maybe something like that should be true, but I, I yeah, I know what it's it gets quite you know this reach full of boundaries kind of complicated. I don't want to be too too clear, but uh. yeah, thanks. So thank you again.